Well, uh, Lottie and I have always said that we want our little girls to grow up with table manners. Both of us were taught table manners as kids, and we were taught that there are certain rules that need to be followed when you sit down to eat as a family. Rules like, don't start eating until we've given thanks for the food as a family. Don't interrupt conversation. Don't get up and leave the table until everybody else has finished eating. And if you do want to get up and leave, you first say thank you for the food and you ask to be excused. And then lastly, don't speak with a mouth full of food. Well, we have found that this last rule has been the most difficult rule to obey in our household. And we constantly have to remind our little girls not to speak while they are chewing their food. You know, we, we feel so proud as parents that we are instilling such moral and ethical values in our home. And so you can imagine how humiliating it was when just the other day we were sitting around the dinner table and I began engaging in full-on conversation whilst chewing on my chicken leg. <laughs> my five-year-old looks at me and says, Dad, we don't speak with a mouth full of food. <laughs> you got me. Well, sometimes we hear things that we don't really want to hear. And sometimes Jesus said things that his hearers didn't want to hear. Sometimes what he had to say was very difficult and painful to receive. And even some of those who claimed to be devout followers left him because of some offensive thing that he had to say. In Luke chapter 12, for instance, Jesus tells his hearers that he had come to bring fire on the earth and division instead of peace. The Messiah bringing division instead of peace? He tells his hearers that they know how to interpret weather conditions, but would not apply the same interest and energy in trying to interpret spiritual conditions. Jesus was not afraid of telling people the uncomfortable truth. And he continues the trend in Luke chapter 13, where he's dealing with the topic that makes people cringe. And it's in this cringe-worthy chapter that I would like for us to camp this morning. But before I read the text, let me say that what we're about to hear is a great gift from God. And it will be painful to the pride and selfishness in us, but that is what is most needed for us. When we go to a surgeon, we'll gladly allow him to cut us open in order to heal what is broken and sick. And so may I encourage us this morning, no matter how painful it may be to hear, may we go to the Holy Spirit, the surgeon, in surrender, and may we allow him to do whatever he wants to do in our hearts. Because unless he exposes it, there is no healing and therefore no ultimate Joy. So I'm going to ask that before we read the text, if we could just take a few seconds to close our eyes and just to lay down our defenses, to invite God to say what he wants to say and to do whatever he wants to do in our hearts. Let's do that together. Father, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Help us, Lord, to be like little children and to receive what you have for us today. Thank you that you are a good father who only ever gives good gifts to your children, even when those gifts feel painful. Amen. So we're gonna be reading uh, in Luke chapter 13 today. It is on page 71 on, in your church Bibles in the, in the New Testament. So take some time to find it. I'll be reading from verse one, Luke chapter 13. 
Okay, let's read together. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. All those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. So Jesus is teaching a crowd of people, but something is bothering some of those present. And so they raise the issue with Jesus. Teacher, can you tell us a little bit more about those Galileans whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices? You see, it had become news in Jerusalem that there were some Galileans who had made their way down to the temple in Jerusalem during Passover. And Pilate had caught wind of this, and maybe he thought that they were part of some rebel movement. And so while they were offering their sacrifices in the temple, he sent soldiers to slaughter them. The thought is sickening. Can you imagine, we're worshiping here one Sunday, and armed gunmen come in the back, and they mow us all down because they think that we're rebelling against the government in some way. You get the picture. There's blood everywhere, as the blood of these Galileans is mixed with the animals that they are sacrificing. It's a tragic and horrific act of violence, and everyone would have known about it. But the reason that it's brought to Jesus' attention is because Jesus is in the midst of speaking about judgment. And it's generally believed in that time that uh, judgment comes about when someone's done something horrible. That those who had sinned in some extraordinary way and were guilty and were keeping it hidden would be judged and calamity and misfortune would come their way. And so maybe people want clarity on this. Maybe they're asking, is this really the case? Or perhaps they're comparing themselves to these Galileans. Maybe they thought that because of their goodness and moral superiority, they had escaped such horrendous things, like it ha- those things that had happened to the Galileans. And obviously the Galileans had offended God in some way. So it was all very neat and self-satisfying. Come on, Jesus, expound on the moral inadequacies of these Galileans who met such scandalous deaths so that we can feel better about ourselves and have more reason to believe that we will escape the judgment that you're speaking about. Do we perhaps still subtly hold this mindset? In our sin and brokenness, do we maybe believe that when we see people suffering, it must be because of their sin? Well, maybe it's not that extreme, but maybe we deeply believe that we are morally superior to others. And so we expect those who have done worse things in their lives than us to be judged more severely. And maybe we expect us, ourselves, to be more blessed than those who have done horrible things. Spiritual pride can so easily creep into our lives, can't it? Well, we must guard against it. And as Andrew Murray says, there is no pride so dangerous, none so subtle and insidious as the pride of holiness. But Jesus, in typical fashion, refused to play their game, and so he launches into a completely left field direction that would have astonished his hearers. And he says to them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way. I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Jesus was not denying that sometimes sin brings tragedy because it does, but he flatly refused the idea that all tragedy is due to the sins of its victims. Death happens. Tragedies come to us all 
And sometimes the most unthinkable things happen to the most godly. So to drive home his point, in verse four, Jesus presents them with another example. The death of 18 residents in Jerusalem on whom a tower collapsed. It's an incident that is also well known to those who are hearing about it. And some of Jesus' hearers could have argued that the Galileans got what they deserved because of this political rebellion. But no one there on that day could say the same about the random deaths of those on whom this tower collapsed. And so Jesus says, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Jesus could not have put it more clearly and forcefully. Guys, those who died were no more sinful than the rest of you. Whether killed by Pilate because of some horrendous political rebellion, or whether killed by a tower in a freak accident. No matter who you are, you sin. And whether your sin is something as serious as murder or anarchy or something as, as seemingly innocent as telling a lie. James says that if you break the law at just one point, you are guilty of breaking all of it. The playing field is level. And we all fall horribly short of the standard of perfection that God requires. We are guilty and therefore death will come to us all as a perfectly just consequence. It's as if Jesus is saying to those in the crowd, stop worrying about the Galileans or anyone else for that, for that matter who you think is more wicked than you. Start worrying about yourself. Why? Because you are just as wicked. And unless you repent, you will also perish when the final judgment comes. Tragedy could strike any minute, but you are standing before me today. And so use this moment to reflect on the tragedies of those Galileans and those 18 who died and let those tragedies remind you that you might not have it tomorrow. Repent or perish, Israel. And to make sure that no one misunderstood what he was saying, he told them a parable. And we're gonna pick up the parable from verse six. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Le leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Well, as we unpack this parable, we'll see that the parable is actually built on three symbolisms. The first of those is the fig tree. And the fig tree represents Israel. The fig tree was a common metaphor for Israel throughout the Old Testament. And we'll also notice that the tree was planted in a vineyard, which wasn't at all strange in that time. But what this does tell us is that the fig tree was planted in perfect conditions. The soil around the fig tree would have been fertile. It was more than likely planted on a sunny slope and it was undoubtedly well treated. Well, the parable tells us that the owner of the vineyard, the second symbol in the parable, and the symbol that I believe represents God's just judgment, came looking for fruit on the tree. The fact that the owner came looking for fruit on the tree means that he expected it to be a tree that produced fruit, mature enough to be able to do so. And so it is absolutely clear that there is no reason in the world why this fig tree should not be producing fruit. Everything is set up for it to do that. And there was no reason in the world why Israel should not have produced fruit. They too were planted in perfect spiritual conditions. Think of the privileges they enjoyed. God's elect people set apart from all the others to be his own. God had made covenants with them. 
God had given them the law, temples, priests, sacrifices. He'd set them free from slavery in Egypt and brought them to the promised land. And then the greatest privilege of all, he'd given them. From them would come the Messiah. It would be very reasonable to expect Israel to be more godly and holier than any other nation. And yet what do we see in the parable? No fruit. Not after one year, not after two years, not after three years, more than enough time for the owner of the vineyard to see a return on his investment. But nothing. The fig tree that was Israel was fruitless. They were blind to the things of God, deaf to the word of God, and their hearts remained hard to the mercy of God. Now, common sense would say, just cut the tree down. It's taking up valuable space. I mean, another tree could occupy that space. Why on earth are you allowing it to still exist? And so the owner rightly says to the caretaker or the vine dresser in verse seven, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? And in saying this, Jesus was making this point to these spiritually prideful Israelites. Despite all that God has given you, despite the perfect spiritual conditions you've been placed in, you remain fruitless and you deserve to be cut down. You deserve the judgment of God and you may think that because you're still alive, God's delayed judgment and therefore kindness to you will last forever, but I tell you that unless you use this moment to repent, you too will perish and be excluded from God's salvation. And this brings us to our third symbol in the parable, the caretaker or the vine dresser. And in verse eight, we see him replying to the owner. Sir, leave it alone for one more year and, I, and I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then, then you can cut it down. This caretaker is interceding for this fig tree, urging the owner to show mercy, just to give this fig tree one last opportunity to produce fruit, and he promises that he'll do whatever it takes. He, he, he'll dig around it, he'll loosen the soil, he'll fertilize, but if in a year's time after all of that nurturing care, it still hasn't produced any fruit, well then fine. It's time to cut it down. Well, who does the caretaker in the parable symbolize? And I believe that the caretaker symbolizes God's patient mercy. It's God's patient mercy. This caretaker who's taken the time to plant this fig tree, maybe a little seed or a baby tree, every day watering it, making the soils fertile, pruning it, watching it grow, making sure that there were no insects or parasites that have, could, have, could have destroyed the tree. He has this caretaker pleading, pleading the mercy of God, pleading against the judgment of God for more time. Please, just one more year. I will do whatever I have to do. You see, God is both just and he is merciful. And sometimes we think that his mercy is a great characteristic, but his justice is not so nice. But the reality is we all want justice. We hate it when there are people in positions of authority who are unjust and corrupt. But when we're at the object, when we're the guilty ones, then justice is a problem. You see, God is both just and merciful, and it would have been absolutely fair and right and just for this fruitless tree to be cut down and destroyed. And yet, here we see God's mercy. Great love, great patience, he extends astonishing mercy to Israel. And he gives them yet another day, another opportunity to recognize their fruitlessness and to repent. Repent. 
But friends, is this parable only meant for Israel? I don't think so. Because as Christians, God expects us to be producing fruit. And so I think we need to ask ourselves this morning whether the fig trees of our lives are fruit-bearing fig trees. We know what the fruit is meant to be, and so as we take an honest look at ourselves, let's ask ourselves, is there ever increasing love for God and others in our lives? Is there a growing joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, or if we're honest with ourselves, are we a little bit stale and lukewarm? As you look back over your Christian life, do you see transformation? Do you see your heart changing? Has it grown softer? One commentator asks some challenging questions. Young people who've been reared in church and enjoyed the benefits of its, of its gospel proclamation since the day that you were born, where is the return on God's investment in you? Long-time members of the church who have spent decades in these pews, where is the fruit? Where is the evidence of a life of repentance in our families, our neighborhood, and in our workplaces? I was uh, on a retreat this past week in Amanis, my first time down there, absolutely beautiful area. I stayed at a retreat center, if you can call it that, called Fulmut. But it was one of the more difficult weeks that I've experienced in a long time. Because the Holy Spirit put a spotlight on my heart over the course of that week. And he did a surgery in my life and he was exposing to me things that, oh my word, I didn't want to look at. I had a glimpse of my brokenness and sin and I was faced with some very real facts about myself. That I can be spiritually prideful, thinking that I'm more superior than others. I have a strong idol of control, thinking I can do a better job of running my life than God. That I hide behind masks of falsehood, pretending to God and others that everything's okay, but meanwhile in my heart, I'm a mess. That I, I don't actually know how to receive God's love, and I actually don't know how to give it back. Well, one afternoon, myself and the guys I was staying with, we went to visit a wine farm, and on this wine farm were rows and rows of grapevines. Dry, fruitless grapevines. So ironic, seeing as that I was gonna be preaching on this parable in just a few days' time. And it was as if God was reminding me of the lack of fruit in my own life. And it was as if he was reminding me how confession and repentance daily, that, that needs to be a rhythm, that needs to be what I do. It was sobering, especially after some wine tasting. Okay, I had to put in one joke, it's a heavy sermon. You see, I think that God is calling both you and I this morning to repent of fruitlessness. But I don't think he's just asking us to repent of fruitlessness. Because I think we need to be asking ourselves the question, is there any fruit in our life that doesn't honor God? Paul speaks about fruit of the flesh. Sexual immorality, marital unfaithfulness, pornography, sexual fantasy, impurity, maybe filthy language. Maybe we've become numb to the things that we watch on TV or on social media. Debauchery, excessive indulgences in our lives, idolatry and witchcraft, anything other than God that is taking up our worship, our time, our energy, and our resources. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. How are our relationships with others? Drunkenness, orgies, and whatever else you wanna add to that list. Is the Holy Spirit maybe taking his scalpel and gently operating on you this morning? And though it's painful, let me urge you not to resist it because this is the very best thing that can happen to you and me, for God to expose what's broken and sinful and for God to kill our kingdoms so that his 
fruit-bearing life can live in and through us. God has extended incredible mercy to us. And like Israel, we have also been planted in perfect spiritual conditions. In fact, I think that the privileges we enjoy far exceed those of Israel's. We've been given Bibles at the touch of our fingertips. We've got cars. We can drive to church and listen to God's word preached. We've got music and books and countless resources, all that are able to help our growth. We have been given mercy after mercy. Well, in the parable, the caretaker promises to do whatever it takes to get this fig tree to produce fruit. And God did. In the greatest extension of mercy in history, God sends his very own son. At cost to himself, Jesus, the Messiah, has come for both Israel and for us. And Jesus is saying to us this morning, I am the extended mercy of God. I've been sent by this patient, slow to anger, rich in love father to be cut down for your fruitful, fruitlessness. That means that I bore the judgment. That means that I perished for your sake. And as a result, no matter how fruitless your life is, or no matter how sinful it is, you can be forgiven, you can be received, and you can escape the judgment of God if you kneel at my feet in confession and repentance. The fact that we are here this morning, church, alive today is evidence that the caretaker, the mercy of God is still at work in our lives. We have the Holy Spirit who even now this morning is working on the soil of our hearts, loosening and digging up whatever he needs to, bringing us to a place where we can own our brokenness and stop hiding and pretending, own it and come to God to receive his grace and his mercy. If you are a Christian here this morning, there is no reason in the world why you should not be producing fruit. We all deserve the judgment of God and for our fig trees to be cut down and yet here we are this morning with another opportunity. God has extended incredible mercy to us. Let us hear Jesus' words. Repent or you too will perish. But maybe I need to spend some time clarifying what repentance is because I know for me it's always been a scary word. Like I don't wanna be told to repent. That freaks me out. So what is repentance? Well. Repentance is not an emotional experience. It's not crying and feeling sorry for yourself and because you feel sorry for yourself, you think you've repented and you're in a better space with God. No, that's not repentance. Repentance isn't a mechanical, fear-based, guilt-driven striving to not sin and to be more obedient. That's not repentance either. I don't know if you've seen that clip where there's this lady who visits a psychologist And the lady has a terrible fear of being buried alive in a box. And she goes to see the psychologist and right up front, before she even has an opportunity to unpack what she's struggling with, the psychologist says, oh, it's gonna be a very short session, I can assure you. Anyway, so she she starts unpacking and she tells the psychologist, no, all my life I've struggled with this fear of being buried alive in a box. And the psychologist, to her relief, says, well, I've got great advice for you. So she takes out her notepad and she's ready to start making notes. She says, no, you don't need a notepad. It's only two words. Okay. So she's waiting and he leans forward and he says to her, stop it. (laughs) Just, Just stop it. Stop being scared of being buried alive in a box. I think sometimes we think that that's what repentance is. God just telling us to stop. And we've all tried that. It doesn't work. Just stop your sin. Okay, thanks, you can go home. I'm finished preaching now. (laughs) You see, repentance is a change of heart and mind. It happens from the inside out, not the other way around. Well, how does the, the mind and the heart change? Well, firstly, it takes us being honest 
being honest with the fact that we've offended God. And then it takes us being honest with confession and owning up to God in detail the things that we've done in our lives, the things that we still do. Saying, Lord, I am broken. I am sinful and I have offended you and I do deserve your judgment. That would be right and fair. I have not understood how patient you are. I have not understood how much you love me and how much you've extended your mercy towards me. And therefore, I have not responded with a life of fruitfulness, Lord, and I'm sorry. But maybe your confession this morning is quite similar to my confession. And maybe you need to confess that even your repentance is not genuine, that you're not as remorseful as you ought to be, and that you feel more sorry for your own sake than God's. Maybe it's saying, I want to, want to have a pure motive in my repentance. We're so good at hiding. We avoid the reality of our brokenness and sin like the plague. We pretend before God, we pretend before others, we'll do anything to make sure that nobody gets to see this because if they see this, they'll reject me. But listen to this church, when we surrender, when we humble ourselves, and when we confess the details, the reality of what's going on in here, when we get vulnerable with others and with God, we think, we think we're gonna be rejected but what happens? We're received, we're loved, and we find as we get vulnerable with God that the caretaker himself is right there beside us. We find the mercy of God in Jesus embracing us and whispering in our ear, thank you for being honest. I'm not surprised. I knew all these things. I just want you to be honest with me and I love you, and I receive you, and I forgive you. I call you child. Well, at this retreat that I was on, uh, it was a retreat that was run by Journey South Africa, and there were about 30 participants, and uh, the, the time was structured um, with mainly kind of large group teaching sessions, and then we would break into smaller groups of four to five. And on one of the teaching sessions, uh, we were learning about confession. And towards the end of this, this teaching session, uh, the, the person who was doing the teaching told us just to take out a piece of paper and that he was gonna give us space for 15, 20 minutes to allow God to reveal to us anything, anything that we feel guilty and ashamed about, and then to write it down on that piece of paper. Anything we've said, done, thought about, just write it down in detail on the piece of paper. I was uncomfortable in the room and people started you know, taking out their pens. And after about 15, 20 minutes, he said, okay, well, we're gonna have a small group time now and I'd like for you to take your piece of paper and to share and to confess to your group or everything that you've written down. Oh my word. Oh, yeah, I mean, people wanted to leave the room, it was, it was terrible. So we get to our group and we're sitting there Four, four or five other guys in the group with me, and it's my, my turn to share, and I am trembling. And here I am with my piece of paper, and I start sharing and you know, reading these things out, and then the leader's like, sorry, could you just go into a little bit more detail there? <laughs> okay, so go into a little bit more detail there. Share, share, share. At that stage, I, I mean, I, I really did want to be buried alive in the box. I was petrified, but, but what happened was amazing. These are people I've never met before. I'm sharing all my junk with them. And instead of being rejected, they loved me, received me, and pointed me to Jesus in a way that, man, I, it never felt that amazing before. Maybe it's because I've been hiding all these things. And that, church, is how Jesus responds to us when we get honest. When a broken, fruitless heart comes in honest confession of its sin, it expects to be cut down. But when it realizes that Jesus was cut down on its behalf, and that instead of being rejected, it is received, it is forgiven, it is loved, 
Do you know how it responds? With deep gratitude. The mind and the heart change when the grace of God is seen in light of our sin and brokenness. When we can see what Jesus did for us because we're getting honest about our mess, our minds and our hearts change. And what happens? Repentance. Authentic repentance. We respond with the deep gratitude that says, this is overwhelmingly beautiful, Lord. I am astonished at how patient you are. And I don't need to keep running to sin because that just doesn't do it for me. But in this moment, the needs of my heart are being met in your love in a way that I've never experienced before. And the only thing I want to do is respond with a life of willing repentance. And I want to do that day in and day out because that, that's what it is. Confession and repentance isn't a once off. It's got to become a rhythm where we're living with God in this relationship of confession and repentance. And as we do that, we can trust God to be producing fruit in our lives. The mercy of God in the place of judgment of God blows us away. It changes our minds and hearts and it leads to a grateful response of willing repentance. Well, you'll notice that the parable doesn't actually conclude because we don't know what happens to this fig tree. We don't know whether the fig tree ends up producing fruit. We don't know whether the fig tree ends up being cut down. Why does Jesus do that? Because the parable of our lives has not concluded. Because we have this moment. Tomorrow the parable may conclude. Tomorrow you may perish. But today you're here and you have an opportunity to draw near to your Savior in honest confession and to allow his grace to wash over you so that it produces honest repentance. The writer of Hebrews says, today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your hearts. I'm gonna ask us to do that this morning. You may wanna come forward and kneel at the front as a symbol of you falling at the foot of the cross again. You may wanna stay seated. But what I would like for us to do is to take time this morning We don't do it often enough as a church. And just to sit and to get real with God and to confess. And if the tears come, don't resist them because that's part of our hiding. But just confess and let the grace of God wash over you. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come forward. They're gonna sing a song of surrender. I lay me down. And feel free in your own time if you wanna sing with or if you just wanna be silent and do business with God, take time to do that, but let us, let us as a church spend time with God now and take his words seriously.